Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center here at the library. We're the sponsor of this event. The Kluge Center's mission is to connect thought and action, bridging the gap between scholarship on the one hand and the policy-making community and the interested public on the other. The center does this by bringing leading thinkers in the humanities and social sciences to the library for periods in residence to do research in the collections here at the library and by showcasing work of those scholars and other prominent writers in public events. This evening event is part of a year-long initiative at the library inviting visitors to explore America's change makers. The conversation tonight is also an early introduction to the upcoming suffrage exhibit entitled Shall Not Be Denied. That opens on June 4th. Later this year, and next in the Changemaker series, the library will feature events connected to, quote, Rosa Parks, in her own words, end quote, an exhibit opening on December 5 later this year. Let me introduce tonight's panelists. Elaine Weiss, right uh, in the purple over here, or <laughs> lavender, I don't know what that is, is an award-winning journalist and writer. Her magazine feature writing has been recognized with prizes from the Society of Professional Journalists and her byline has appeared in The Atlantic, Harper's, The New York Times, Boston Globe, and Philadelphia Inquirer. She has also developed reports and documentaries for National Public Radio and Voice of America. Her recent book, The Woman's Hour, is the topic of our conversation. According to Margot Lee Shetterly, anyone interested in the history of our country's ongoing fight to put its founding values into practice, as well as those seeking the roots of current political thought fault lines would be well served by picking up this book. By the way, you can do so right after the event. <laughs> Apparently, Steven Spielberg picked up this book as he opted it for a film ser series. Elaine is also the author of Fruits of Victory, The Woman's Land Army in the Great War, which was excer excerpted in the Smithsonian Magazine and featured on C-SPAN and public radio stations nationwide. She holds a graduate degree from the Medill School of Journalism of Northwestern University, she has worked as a Washington correspondent, congressional aide, speechwriter, magazine editor, and university journalism instructor. Colleen Shogan is an assistant deputy librarian for collections and services here at the Library of Congress. Colleen previously worked as a legislative assistant in the Senate before coming to the Congressional Research Service at the library in 2008, where she served as deputy director. Colleen has a PhD in American politics from Yale University and a BA from Boston College. She teaches a graduate seminar on American political development at Georgetown University mm -hmm. and is the librarian of Congress's designee on the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. Please join me in welcoming mm -hmm. Elaine and Colleen. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, Elaine, welcome back to the Library of Congress. Thank you so much. I think we're going to have a terrific conversation this evening. I'd like to start out with a broader question. Um, so when women's suffrage movement lasted for over 70 years, and when it began, the idea of women voting was a radical idea. And when it concluded, it was, as you've said, inevitable. So how did this transformation happen? And what does it tell us about social change in the United States? It developed in fits and starts and slowly. Um, I think that's what it tells us about social change. Mm -hmm. It began, again, um, the ideas come out of um, the, the spirit of reform and revolution in the 1840s. Of course, it's talked about much beyond. Uh, women knew that they were not equal in American life uh, or in domestic life, but they certainly knew that the Constitution gave them no protection and gave them uh, none of the privileges of citizenship. So it was something that was talked about uh, privately for a long, long time. The, the movement begins to gain steam in the 1840s, and one of the things that was uh, interesting to me is it comes out of the abolition movement. But it also comes out of uh, a recognition that women are, are being placed in this what was called private sphere, meaning the domestic sphere. They weren't supposed to leave home. That was really it. Those beautiful petticoats and 
um, hoop skirts and bonnets and tight whalebone corsets. That was to keep women in the house, to make it hard to, to move around, hard to go outside. So there are women who begin to think about this and say, this isn't right. And you see a slow, slow chipping away. So in 1848, when um, that, that first women's rights conference is um, called in Seneca Falls by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her friends, um, and it's really, they were talking around the tea table. They'd been talking about this for years. Uh, and I explain how, how that discussion progressed. And then they decide to have this public meeting and they're really shocked. They, they plan it just five days in advance, like less time than most people would have a dinner party. <laughs> and they put an advertisement in the paper and 300 people show up and they're really shocked by that. And they had planned for it, but not, very deeply, and one of the demands uh, that, uh, or the assortment of demands and resolutions that Stanton comes up with, um, asks for a whole range of changes in, in women's role in society. And it's not, the vote is only one of them, and, and uh, as I explained, the vote was considered the most uh, outrageous of them. And the other organizers, including Lucretia Mott, the great, radical reformer, the, the, the wonderful, um, brave Quaker abolitionist says, no, Lizzie, don't do this. It's gonna make us look really silly. Um, so the idea of women, um, the other thing she asked for is she said men have um, basically made women feel like they're not worth uh, equal citizenship. I, I forget the phrasing. It's a beautiful formalistic phrasing that she uses. But she said, she, they, you have undermined our self-confidence in the way we're treated. And we're also not allowed to speak in public. Uh, women speaking to a group like this would be called promiscuous. We have different meaning for that now. But it was called promiscuous, especially if men were present. Um, so women were not allowed and not supposed to speak in public. They, of course, couldn't um, own property if they were married. It belonged to their husband. Their children belonged to their husband. They had no custodial rights. They couldn't serve on a jury. They couldn't be judged by a jury of their peers. They could not um, uh, testify in court. They weren't considered eligible to do that, and they couldn't even um, um, press a suit, a civil suit. So they were really civilly dead. So there's the civil side of, of, their, of the sub subjugation, but there's also the personal side of how they were meant to feel in society. And so this whole suffrage movement is part of a women's rights movement, and it's part of a change, the reason it was so hard, it's a part of a change, women's role in society. So um, a lot of, again, there's a lot of history in those 70 years. There's wars in which women mm -hmm play a big part, especially World War I, where they start doing things, mm -hmm. taking on tasks that women had never done before, and it kind of shows the nation that women can, can do more than just take care of babies um, or teach school. And so there, there, are, there are historical forces mm -hmm. that propel the changes, but mostly it's a slow, slow societal change that the suffragists try to, to accelerate by going out and preaching. I mean, that's what they do. Uh, Stanton and Anthony are on the road constantly preaching. You've written the book in a very engaging style. It is a nonfiction book. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it reads like a, a political thriller. So can you tell us why you decided to write this book in that style? Well, I'm, I'm always very gratified when uh, a reader writes to me and says, I loved your novel. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I say, thank you very much. Uh, but there are those 750 end notes at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can't make anything up. I wish I could. Um, I wanted it, when I looked, uh, when I first began, and I mm -hmm. saw that there was very little popular work on, on suffrage. There's some fantastic scholarship, um, wonderful scholarship, but it's not read by, by the general public for the most part. 
I think we're going to see a lot more of that as the centennial approaches. But I wanted to make this for the general reader because basically I, I realized I knew nothing about how women won the vote. And when I talked to my friends, I asked them and they'd say, well, no, I, I don't really know. Seneca Falls, right? Mm -hmm. Seneca Falls. <laughs> so I realized that we didn't know. We had no idea. So to, in order to make this an accessible book, I wanted to write it in an accessible st style. Uh, I'm not a scholar, I'm a journalist, and so that came more naturally mm -hmm. to me also. Um, but I had to use techniques that I had never uh, had to practice before, such as suspense. Uh, not something that I, I had a lot of experience with, mm -hmm. and I had to learn how to do it. And uh, both my literary agent and my editor helped me understand what it took to do that. You have to sort of plot out what your reader will know, what they have to know. Uh, at certain points, what they can't know at certain points. So it was a very interesting process for me. It was, it was a different technique that I had to learn. Um, but mostly I wanted these characters, especially the women, to, to take on real life, to, to be true, to be women, not just these historical stick figures, which is really how they're portrayed. Um, we, you know, to know them, uh, a little bit, and it's not a psychodrama. Uh, I don't go into their, their lives that deeply, but I want my readers to understand their motivations. Why would a woman in the 19th century or the early 20th century dedicate her life to this cause? Why would she do that? What propels her? Uh, what are her, her fears? What are her mistakes? And I wanted that to become part of the book, and so an accessible style made that possible, and, and I think that's um, one of the ways a reader can connect to the story and, and not just have this cavalcade of dates and, and characters come through. You did a lot of research for this book and a lot of libraries and yes. archives. Can you tell us about your research here at the Library of Congress using the women's suffrage collections? Well, the Library of Congress collection is you know, the base and the fountain and, and the lodestone of what I could do, and for so many researchers it is. But uh, for me, it, this is where the papers are. And from the manuscript collection um, over in the Madison building um, to uh, the general uh, women's suffrage collection, which is, has, has many parts uh, and is very, very, deep and important. So to give you an example, um, I, there, were, there were many, I had to go through the National Women's Party, which is Alice Paul's more radical wing of the, of the suffrage uh, movement. And um, I wanted to, to get the correspondence between the organizers. And that was very, very fertile ground for me. But what that entailed is going through all of their papers, and for, for a certain, uh, they're in chronological order. So I knew I had to look at this, you know, half year of everything that went through that office. Um, and the Library of Congress has it. Mm -hmm. It's on microfilm. And so mm -hmm. I borrowed through interlibrary loan um, the microfilm. I live in Baltimore, and my husband has, is a professor at Johns Hopkins, so I have access to the library. I spent probably an entire winter uh, in the airless, windowless, <laughs> microfilm room in the bottom of the Eisenhower Library um, and looking at the microfilm and seeing every single piece of paper that went through that office. And m much of it was not useful, but even the things I didn't know was useful. That's the thing about research. Even the things you weren't looking for, you know, a little note that said that a check had bounced that turned out to be important because I could get an understanding of what the finances of the movement were, and that's an important part. Um, again, a, a complaint that uh, uh, you know a, an organizer wasn't um, able to, to find the person she was sent out to find in the hills of Tennessee. All of that was very, very useful, but, but to get to that, I had to go through every subscription, a <laughs> um, uh, piece of paper, yes, I would like to receive the suffragist, here's my 50 cents, mm -hmm. and I had to go through every one of those uh, pieces of paper. But again, 
Um, that's one of the joys of research. Uh, your eyes do cross. Um, I would come home and, and my husband could say, I could tell you were in the <laughs> microfilm room and my eyes were just like that. But it was, it was essential. If I didn't have that, I couldn't have told the story in the detail that I wanted to tell it. I didn't want to just say. And then they were in Tennessee and they, mm -hmm. you know, they worked hard. I wanted to be able, and I could, through the Library of Congress's papers, I could tell you where each of those organizers were each day. And because they wrote reports back home, longhand, um, I knew exactly what they were thinking and what they were saying. So it was an incredible resource. And then the photographs. Mm -hmm. The Library of Congress photographs are amazing. They are online. You can see them. You can download them, which is really exciting. And they were tremendously important for me, not just to illustrate the book, but for me to actually be able to see the, 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 the history visually. And uh, so that was so important. Uh, you know, I used the uh, Tennessee State Archives, very important, the Schlesinger Collection at Harvard, uh, New York Public Library, lots of lots of different libraries, but the base, the, the, I could not do it without the Library of Congress. And your ability to do some of that online is really good. The, one day the microfilm will be put out digital, it'll be nice. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, it's just the fact that they're here and they're organized, um, makes it so essentially important, not just for me, but for every researcher. You focused the Women's Hour on the last six weeks of the women's suffrage movement. Can you tell us why you decided to focus on that time frame? Well, that's actually a Library of Congress story, too. Um, I was researching a different aspect. I was actually interested in a bequest that had been given to the suffrage movement by this very colorful um, publisher in New York named Mrs. Miriam Leslie. Uh, she appears in the book, but I was very interested in her, and I began reading a, uh, a report here in the Library of Congress of how that bequest, which was $2 million in 1914, it was a lot of money, how it was spent. And in the report, it was like a 95-page report of, of how it was spent, it's, it, it delineated each of the, the uh, ways it, that it had been used. And the very last one was for the ratification effort. One was for lobbying here in Congress. Um, one was to start the League of Women Voters. Um, one was for publicity. But this was for um, the ratification fight, uh, which they had to wage in all 40, 48 states. And in that description, it talked about the, what happened in the very last battle for the last state. And I read that and went, whoa, I've never heard that before. And I actually uh, wrote to a few um, suffered scholars mm -hmm. who I knew and said, have you ever know that story? And they said, no. I said, hmm. And what I didn't know is how, you know, how much I could tell. And after some more research, I realized that this was an amazing story. And through that story of what happens in Nashville, Tennessee in the summer of 1920, which is that last battle for the last state to ratify, um, because of the characters who are present, they allow me to, to reach back to the whole history uh, of the movement. And so through flashbacks mm -hmm. and, and other devices, I could really tell you how they got to Tennessee, why they got to Tennessee. And so we have a front story of what's going on in Tennessee and also what's going on here in Washington, because there's lots of movement, uh, and what's going on in the presidential election of 1920. All of that bears upon it. But I could reach back and tell you uh, the story of Seneca Falls and the story of uh, Susan B. Anthony going to jail um, or being tried to go uh, and being convicted. Um, I could tell you all that because of the women who converged upon, pardon me, converged upon Tennessee. So that became a, a very um, good vehicle to tell the story, and it is very dramatic and, um, and suspenseful. So for, as a writer, that was a gift. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be able to, to then use that 
as the pivot to go back was really mm -hmm. uh, exciting. Much of the story is set at the Hotel Hermitage in Nashville. <laughs> yes. This is a very colorful setting. Can yeah. you talk about it a little bit? Describe it to everyone? Sure. It's not just a, ho it's a hotel, but there's many parts of the hotel that play <laughs> a part. Yeah, so uh, again, this is now July 1920, and the, through various machinations, the, um, the amendment, the 19th Amendment, the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, which will for the first time, give the right to vote to all women in every state, in every election. They, uh, about a thousand people converge on little old sleepy Nashville. Uh, and all the legislators are called back from their summer vacations. They are not pleased. And they all kind of take up residence, most of them, in the most luxurious, hotel in the city, which is called the Hotel Hermitage. It's a bit, just about two blocks from the State House. And it's, um, so it's very convenient. And it's really, it's called in the news accounts, the third house of the legislature, because every, lots of stuff is going on there. Um, so imagine this, and sometimes I thought of it as a Marx Brothers movie, because you have the, both wings of the suffrage party, so you have Carrie Catt, the, the mainstream uh, suffrage head, uh, two million uh, women are members of her national association. She comes down from New York. Um, the National Women's Party also has their headquarters uh, on a different floor. They're doing their <laughs> own strategy for their common goal, but on a different track. Uh, then you have the anti-suffragists, the women who were opposed to women getting the vote. They have their uh, very colorful uh, headquarters on the mezzanine of the of the hotel. Then you have the lobbyists coming in, um, the railroad interests, the textile interests, the liquor interests, and these are the people who are fighting, um, trying to get to kill kill ratification. Um, the liquor interests do the most uh, flamboyant lobbying. They they open what was called the Jack Daniels Suite. <laughs> uh, on the eighth floor. Now you have to understand that prohibition is in effect mm -hmm. in the summer of 1920. Volstead acts have gone into effect and it is 24 seven liquor. Oh, oh. <laughs> Anytime, morning, noon and night. And the, the liquor industry sponsors this for the anti-suffragists and any legislator can go up there and get plastered um, as long as he listens to reasons why he should uh, mm -hmm. vote against suffrage. <laughs> so you have the eighth floor where, you know, nobody talked about it, but there were this mysterious elevator um, <laughs> stops at, at the eighth floor, and then they'd come down, and they were, they were just bouncing off the walls and singing, keep the home fires burning through, through the night, and the suffragists <laughs> can't sleep. Um, and then you have the lobby. It's a beautiful, beautiful lobby, and it, it actually has a stained glass um, ceiling. And so you have, again, everyone's smoking. Uh, it is deep summer, and I can tell you, I, I actually started the research in August. I wanted to feel the heat. It was sort of like method acting for <laughs> historians. I wanted to feel what it was like and imagine what it was like yeah. to be wearing heavy clothing, uh, long skirts in that kind of heat. Uh, no air conditioning, of course. Uh, a kind of weak fan going around. And they're all, um, it's just this constant din in the lobby where they're all um, talking to each other, making deals, convincing each other. And of course, the legislators, the 100 mm -hmm. legislators, 130 legislators are there. So it's this wild scene. Um, and there's, uh, the, they, com they complain that uh, their telegrams are being um, stolen. Uh, there are spies going around in the halls listening to what the suffragists are saying, and so they have to decide whether to open or close the transoms uh, above their doors because if they close it, they won't be able to hear what they're saying, but they'll also suffocate because it's so hot. So they have to make this decision whether they're gonna open the transoms. Um, so it's this wild, wild scene. Um, and one of the kind of wonderful things is that Hermitage is still there. Yep. It's now a very luxury hotel. It went through a period of decline, but it's now this five-star hotel. They've restored the lobby. 
um, it, it's very beautiful. And when I went there for um, for the the, the uh, launch of the book mm -hmm. last year, they actually put me up wow. um, at this hermitage. It was very very nice. And what I didn't realize when I kind of opened the room, I, I gasped because they had put me in Carrie Cat's room oh, uh -huh. uh, on the third floor. And as soon as I opened the door, I knew it because she describes looking at the Capitol uh -huh. uh, right outside uh -huh. her window. And it's a very beautiful Capitol building. Um, and and I knew that was it. And, and then they kind of laughed and said, did you like your view? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was so, it was important to me to see it because I could see the light play on the, on the um, uh, beautiful uh, marble of the state house, but I also saw how it loomed, how it almost was a character. It, was, it must have been oppressive for her because she was kept there almost in house arrest. She was so controversial. They didn't want her out on the streets. They didn't let her into the, the state house to lobby. She had to stay in her room, and she, all she could do was open the window and hear what was going on, and they'd send messengers running between the state house and her hotel. So it really came alive to me um, seeing that. And then seeing the mezzanine where the anti-suffragists had their, had their uh, amazing um, headquarters and, and museum. You have some surprises in the book, though. Uh, we know how it ends, but uh, along the way, there's some uh, things that are pretty unpredictable. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, not a suff. No. Edith Wilson, who's running the country at the time because of Woodrow Wilson's incapacitation, not a suff. No, definitely not a suff. Ida Tarbell, the muckraking journalist, uh, not a suff. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about why you spend, you spend a lot of time in the book talking about the antis. Yeah. And talk about why you decided to do that and also explain why these women who are very modern, contemporary mm -hmm. women in the public sphere, why didn't they think women should vote? Well, I was shocked when, uh, in the documentary evidence, I realized that there were organizations of women all over the country um, opposed to women's suffrage. And I, I just had never thought of that. And maybe you hadn't either, that there really were organized groups. And then I looked who was in these groups, and in many cities um, and at the national level, they were wealthy women well-educated, um, who just didn't want to shake, they, they were perfectly fine with the status quo. They had a nice life. Their brothers and fathers were senators and congressmen uh, and bankers and lawyers, and they could get their opinions uh, filtered up to, to um, powerful men who would listen, or they felt that they trusted their men to make the best decisions for them, and they didn't want to do it. So there's that. Um, sort of wealthy, everything's just fine. Um, that, that's one class of anti-suffrage woman. The others, um, are very interesting, I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt, now she's not an anti-suffragist, I, I would never put her there, but she's not a suffragist, she never supports the movement. Even though her husband, FDR, is now, in 1920, running for the vice presidency, and he has supported it for a decade or more, and she just, doesn't know what her place, she's, she's in her 30s, she has five little children, she really doesn't know what her place as the wife of an ambitious politician should be. And so she is very unsure, she of course grew up in this milieu of women who, you know, Uncle Teddy, she could, mm -hmm. <laughs> she could talk to powerful men, but she, she is so ambivalent that the anti-suffragists really try to court her to join with them. And she doesn't do that, but she also does not vote. When New York state women get the vote through popular referendum in 1917, can vote in 1918, she refuses to vote. So it's, it's a very interesting evolution that you see. Um, but as soon as women do get the vote in 1920, she joins the League of Women Voters. She becomes a, uh, a protege of uh, Carrie Catt, and that's her political beginnings. So, um, and women like Ida Tarbell, mm -hmm. you know, brought, single-handedly brought down John D. Rockefeller and the trusts, but does, fervently does not believe that women should vote. Um, and, and so there's also those who are social and political and sometimes religious conservatives who believe that 
it is against God's plan, is the way they put it, uh, for women to ask for the vote because God made, supposedly she made, um, Adam to be dominant over Eve, and that's the way it is, and they use biblical arguments mm -hmm. against it, mm -hmm. and they also um, say that this is going to bring the moral downfall of the nation. It's going to affect the American family, and there are these wonderful broadsides, I think, that you've seen, um, and I have some in the book, where it's, it's you know, women are going to abandon their families, and um, uh, men are always left with screaming babies, and that's, you know, that, that, that's the, right. the ultimate uh, horror. And, and they're going, you know, there's one called Election Day, and Daddy has these two screaming uh, uh, infants, and Mom is strolling out, and, and Mom says, oh, I have to go to vote. I have to go to vote. <laughs> and there's the implication, the implication that, that she's going to just waltz that's off and right. abandon the family. Right. So there's lots of, there's, there's a lot of fear mm -hmm. of men will be emasculated by this. There's... You know, sometimes when I give a talk, I, I show this very unsubtle, uh, shows a pair of pants and says, who's going to wear the pants in your family after women can vote? Um, there's a lot of fear about this. Mm -hmm. And so you realize it isn't just a political question. It's not just a question whether women can or can't vote. This is uh, a judgment on what women's role in society should be. And so it's much more complicated. It's much more passionate and emotional. And that's why I think it takes so long. And that's why you have women who are really on the other side of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can women act in a way that we might say is against their own interests? Well, I think we have some examples. <laughs> Another major theme in the book is the role of, of race. And really, it comes out that, that race and gender are intertwined yes. in, this, in this story. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why race is so important, particularly at the end of the ratification battle? Yeah, um, I, that was another surprise. Uh, again, because I'm not trained as a suffrage historian, I did not realize the, the, the consequence of race and gender being so intertwined. Again, there are sibling movements throughout um, the, the middle of the 19th century, and the break happens after uh, the Civil War. And basically, all the women we think of as the four mothers, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan Anthony, Lucretia Mott, are really abolition workers. That's where they get their political education as abolition workers. They truly believe that uh, of universal suffrage, and they are promised, and they assume that all their hard work is going to go um, to, to bring about, after the Civil War, the emancipation of the enslaved, the um, uh, enfranchisement of the, both men and women uh, who have been enslaved, and white women too. And so when that does not happen, when they're told that the woman's hour has to wait, uh, when they're told that, it's, uh, that black men will get the vote first, uh, both black men and black women are very, I mean, white women and black women are very upset by this. Um, but it's a political judgment. Um, the, the times are very violent. And this split um, brings about enormous anger in, in parts of the suffrage movement. So you've got that part. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's a racist undertone to, the, to much of the movement, as there is in American society at the time. Uh, we can't expect it to be a very different, uh, completely divorced from what American society is like. When it comes down to Tennessee and the ratification, I was really shocked by the way the anti-suffragists are using race as uh, a cudgel to, to really um, beat the, the suffragists mm -hmm. and say uh, that, imply that they are um, going to change American society this way. They are advocating for uh, equality. Uh, of course, there are some who'd say the suffragists weren't, weren't mm -hmm. that progressive, but what, what happens is in the southern states, uh, it happened in Congress too in trying to convince the southern uh, congressmen and senators, but when it comes to ratification, most of the southern states by the summer of 1920 have rejected the amendment, including 
Maryland, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. Virginia. Uh, DC residents, you didn't have any voice then, you don't have any voice now. Um, <laughs> but they, most of the, the states, Delaware rejected it. So, and why? Most, most of the reason, states' rights and states' rights translated as they don't want black women to vote. And that becomes the reason for rejecting the 19th Amendment. So when it comes down to the last battle in Nashville, like the gloves are off and um, it, the racism in the anti-suffrage mo movement, it, it becomes their, their entire uh, uh, motif. And it's, you know, they attack the suffragists as, um, you know, being, wanting black women to vote. And it's, uh, it gets very, very ugly. And that's how uh, the racism uh, plays out in Tennessee in a southern state. Is race the reason why so many Tennessee state legislators at the end, they switch from the anti, the, the, from pro to anti? Well, it gets complicated. End? There's mm -hmm. lots of, of reasons, some of it uh, money uh, mm -hmm. that, that gets mm -hmm. uh, uh, pumped to them. Um, and there's, there's pressure, there's party pressure. But uh, yes, race is the dominant question um, because it is, uh, our, the 19th Amendment is going to allow and does allow all women to vote, black and white. Of course, it'll take another half century for uh, black women to be able to realize that in the South, but that's not the 19th Amendment. It's the way it was implemented in those states mm -hmm. uh, with the Jim Crow laws and the black codes. Mm -hmm. And it's the way the men of the legislature uh, uh, impeded the, the, uh, the promise of the 19th Amendment. Who is Harry Byrne and why does he play such an important role in American history? Harry Byrne is, uh, you've probably never heard of him. I certainly had not. He is, in 1920, a 24-year-old young man who's studying law at night. Um, he is supporting his widowed mother in East Tennessee. He's from a little hill town called Nyota. He's a freshman uh, representative in his district, and he is the youngest member of the legislature. And he um, is, is reading law under uh, his mentor, who is a very strong anti-suffrage uh, Tennessee senator. And he's under a lot of pressure. His district, for the most part, is against ratification. And he goes there knowing that, and he's gonna be up for re-election in the fall. And he wants a political career. You know, he, this is the beginning of his career. And so he wears the red rose that they wore mm -hmm. insignia, the red rose for the um, uh, anti-suffragists and the what, yellow rose for suffragists. So sometimes it's called the, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> the War of the Roses. And so he wears a red rose and he votes with the anti-suffragists. And yet he gives these hints to the suffragists. He says, my vote will never hurt you. They don't quite understand what that means. Uh, but he keeps voting with the anti-suffragists, so they're not too, you know, they don't believe him very much. Um, but then it'll come down to a pivotal um, vote in the House, and uh, he will receive that morning a letter from his mother, uh, which you can read on the uh, Knoxville, the East Tennessee Historical Society website, if you want to see it. Another wonderful um, example of a library mm -hmm. making very important documents available to the public. You can read all seven pages. It's a wonderful letter. It's a very mom letter. She tells him to buy you know, this and that when he's in the big city. Um, but she gives him some instructions, and it changes history. Uh, and he, he votes a, a vote of conscience. Uh, and then he's, he's um, accused of accepting bribes. It gets very ugly. So when the Suffs win the vote in uh, Tennessee. You're giving it away. Well, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I give, it is, it is does, if you didn't know what happened, you, you wouldn't from reading your book. You, you really are in suspense. They do win, um, uh, but that's not the end, actually. Uh, oh. You think that's the end of the book, but yeah. I noticed there were still like 30 or 40 more pages to go. <laughs> so what happens after they win the vote? It's, it's not like they pop the pseudo champagne and, and just celebrate. No, um, it really, that was another shocking thing. Because I thought, well, okay, they do the vote and 
it'll be all over. Uh -huh. But it really gets wild then. Mm -hmm. um, there is a vote to reconsider. Um, and uh, I'll just tell you, and it doesn't spoil too much, but in the end, um, at the end, the, the, the legislators, uh, the anti-legislators actually abscond across the state border so that they, to avoid a quorum, uh, to, rat to you know, certify the ratification. They pull all kinds of dirty tricks. And um, I won't tell you what happens in the, the real the end, very but, real. but um, it is, they're under such enormous pressure. And again, this presidential election pressure going on. Um, and so you have Warren Harding and uh, uh, Calvin Coolidge and James Cox and FDR uh, in this mix too. But um, they, there is actually, they, they um, pursue the, the men who voted for suffrage. They have what they call indignation meetings around the state and there are bonfires and the Ku Klux Klan comes out uh, and they're threatened. Uh, so it was a, it's rather ugly after they make what we would consider this you know, wonderful, brave um, uh, ratification of, of women's equals rights. And they are, uh, for the most part, punished. And the, the governor is very much punished. Do women come out to vote in 1920? And do they bring the moral force that a lot of the suffragists promised they are going to bring to the ballot box? Yeah, this becomes, so, so ratification happens on August 26th here in Washington uh, when Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby signs it. Uh, so it enters the Constitution and women can vote, but it's only 10 weeks until the election. And so in some states, the registration period has, has uh, expired, so they can't register and they try to get extensions and some states will do it. A, a state like Georgia refuses because it doesn't want black women to vote. So it says no women can vote in 1920, sorry, you know, we, we can't handle it. Um, but there are 27 million women who are eligible. Only about 10 million vote. And it's disappointing to the suffragists who have spent their lives fighting for this. And so the press comes to Carrie Catt um, and says, what happened? You worked so hard. And she gives a very reasoned explanation. She said, you know, voting is a learned experience. You have to learn to do it. You have to get used to it. It has to be part of your life. And it's not part of these women's life, lives yet, for the most part. Of course, there have been women in the West who have mm -hmm. been able to vote for, for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, these women um, don't know how to. But then in the next election, there's an improvement, but it's not, you know, it's only a third, maybe 10 million women who vote. And um, she's asked again, and they say, you know, there's lots of articles in the press, like what happened to women? And, mm -hmm. um, and again, you have to realize that it still wasn't easy for women to vote in some of these communities where it was still not accepted. You know, the law had changed, but the hearts and minds had mm -hmm. not. Um, you were still going to be looked at askew or your minister might say something or your family or your husband. Um, so it was, it was still not easy for some women to vote and they had to, to overcome that. Did they, do, did they fulfill some of the promises that the suffragists hoped they would, like purifying politics? <laughs> I'm not sure they succeeded Burn. in that. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but it's something for us to think about because um, in all the excitement which I share of women um, being elected to the Congress, mm -hmm. uh, largest uh, number ever, 25 in the Senate, 106 in the House, um, part of that is to bring the, a woman's perspective. That's what the suffragists were, were hoping for. But they couched it in the idea that they would bring a higher moral sensibility. Uh, Carrie Catt truly believed that if women could vote, they would abolish war. They would make war illegal. And um, she's very disappointed that doesn't happen too. So it's a very interesting aspect we have to ask ourselves, um, did women fulfill perhaps unrealistic, truly unrealistic goals uh, set for them? Um, and did they, there was never a woman's vote. One of the other things the suffragists promised was they threatened 
uh, if you don't vote for suffrage, you know, there are a lot of women who can vote and they're not going to reelect you. And that didn't happen either because women don't vote as a monolith any more than men do. So there were Republican suffragists and Democratic suffragists and uh, there was never a monolithic um, uh, vote that they could count on. Why do you think it's important at this moment in time in, in American history to, for Americans to know more about the women's stuff, suffrage movement, to know the story? And are there particular demographic groups within the United States that you think would really benefit from knowing more about the story of how women got the right to vote? Well, I think it is an important story. It's one that, that we just don't know. I mean, maybe show of hands, who knew really knowledgeable about the movement. I mean, I'm sure there are, mm -hmm. but it's not taught very much. I mean, if you, you know, look at our textbooks, and I'll, I'll you know, just be cartoonish about this, but uh, not too far off, uh, it's usually a sentence or a paragraph, and it says, you know, there's Seneca Falls, and then in 1920, women were given the vote. And I always kind of laugh at that one. Um, no, they weren't given the vote. And that's it. And this whole idea, this is the largest expansion of our democracy in our history. Uh, it's it's, it's nonviolent. It is uh, an essential um, expansion of what we believe to be democracy. It, it really cuts to the heart of what is democracy. So for us not to know this story is really, um, I think, uh, dangerous because we don't understand what it took, why it was so hard, why the questions it asks about how do we see ourselves as a democratic nation? Why are we afraid of full democracy? And we're asking that question today. We're asking who can vote, who is a citizen? Um, why are there barriers to, to voting? We're still putting barriers up to voting. Um, and to know this history, to know that, that we have a history of doing this, but a history of overcoming it, I think, is an important lesson, especially for young people, especially for those who want to change things, who are activists. This is a story of grassroots activists. These are ordinary women who, you know, around a tea table like this. In fact, the tea table, I think, is in the Smithsonian, <laughs> and it, it does look like this um, at Seneca Falls. And they get the idea they need to change things. And this, these little private discussions become a movement. Um, and not just one where you go on a march, though marching was important in their wonderful white uniforms, but it was also learning the political strategies that were so important. They couldn't just march. They couldn't just pick at the White House. That wasn't going to get them anywhere. They also had a couple of that with campaigning, lobbying, drafting legislation, learning the political levers to pull. Um, and that's the sort of thing that activists today have to learn. Uh, I'm sure many of know them know this, but young people, I think, have a sense, you know, I was on that march, it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, and we've all done that, I certainly have. Uh, but to know what it takes, the, the, the tenacity, these women failed hundreds of times um, they were disappointed, they were devastated, and they got back up, and they had another campaign until it worked. So my last question before we turn it over to the audience, we always ask all of our authors who come to the library, are you working on another book, and if so, can you tell us what it is? And then secondly, um, can you tell us about the Women's Hour and the film project, okay. and can you give us an update on that? Well, the, uh, to answer the first part of your question will be very short, mm -hmm. and uh, not yet is the, <laughs> okay. is the answer. Uh, I haven't had a whole lot of time. Right. Um, but it will definitely involve the Library of Congress, no matter what. Good. <laughs> um, the second is uh, that, that's been an, an extraordinary uh, kind of extra layer of, of uh, excitement. Um, again, one of the most, uh, the, the great pleasure an author has is to hear from her or his readers, and uh, soon after the book came out, I heard from a reader, um, and his secretary, Hillary Rodham Clinton, and she said, this is a very important story, and I think we need, and 
to get it out to a large public because it is important and it's something we don't know. Uh, she said, I didn't know much of this, so it was exciting. And so we are partnering um, on bringing this into a, a popular realm, even more popular than mm -hmm. the book. Um, and so I, I, the form of it is not quite set. I, I, it's probably going to be a television series, mm -hmm. but there's still a, a little bit of mm -hmm. uh, you know, figuring out production on that. Um, we are working with uh, Steven Spielberg's Amblin Television, uh, or his production company, Amblin. And uh, we've been working together, and we have a screenwriter who's excellent. Um, and it's kind of going a little slowly, but it's going. And it's, it's very exciting, and I hope, again, you know, young people, we, we, there'll be an educational aspect to it. We want outreach, we want people to, to watch it together and talk about it and have, you know, um, reading, uh, viewing guides and, and things like that. And so, again, it's to get this story out because it is important. It does teach us um, how to make change in our society, how to make change in a democracy. And um, I think we all agree we have to do that. We have, it has to be improved. And the Constitution is a living document, and our laws are living documents, and they have to be perfected, or towards perfection. And it, I think it's every generation, for the suffragists, it was three generations that right. had to work on improving that. And so that's the lesson I hope um, the book can, can provide, and, and certainly something in, in the popular, popular medium. Questions from the audience for Elaine? What after the the amendment was passed? What did the anti suffs do? Did they continue to not vote, or did they reform? Oh, it's, that's a great <laughs> question. question. Um, it depended. Um, I, I do describe um, the leader of the Tennessee anti suffrage um, organization, who is one of my main characters, Josephine Pearson. Uh, figures out some amazing system back home in, in Monteagle, um, Tennessee, in the Cumberland Plateau, where she lives. And she refuses to go into the polling place, but somehow she gets the men of the town to vote for her. That, she describes this in her, in her uh, mm -hmm. memoir. So I'm not going to talk about the legality of how that happened, uh -huh. but but she directed them. They said, we'll vote for you, Miss Josephine. And so she votes, but she doesn't go to vote. Um, other suffragists, um, anti, pardon me, anti-suffragists, um, say, OK, you have foisted this um, uh, responsibility upon me. I did not want it. I fought against it. But now that I have it, I'm going to use it. And so one of the things I talk about in the afterward, which was really fascinating, is the anti-suffragists get stronger after ratification. The suffragists dissipate. Mm -hmm. They go on, um, uh, Carrie Catt founds the League of Women Voters. And a lot of suffragists go into that idea of educating the American public, both women and men and immigrants, on, on the issues, what they're still doing. They're doing a wonderful job. Uh, registration, all those good things. So that's what she puts her energies, and into actually anti-war uh, and pacifistic uh, world peace uh, initiatives. Alice Paul goes home and says, OK, we have the vote now. Um, now we'll go on to the next things on the agenda. She drafts the Equal Rights Amendment, which is uh, introduced into Congress in 1923. So uh, <laughs> it's, we know where it is now. So. Um, <laughs> But the anti-suffragists actually coalesce. They, they have realized that they can organize and they can be very effective. And so they, and we see, we see this happening in Tennessee, they accuse Carrie Catt and the suffragists of being Bolsheviks and communist uh, agitators. You know, that, that suffrage is a, uh, a foreign idea. And uh, the idea that women could vote is going to undermine American democracy. So they continue to use that um, Bolshevik red baiting uh, throughout the 20s and 30s and 40s. We see it come up again into McCarthy. Um, they, they are uh, different organizations form, and these same women have trained 
uh, and go in, into those organizations. We, Phyllis Schlafly comes out of, they really had training, almost training um, organizations, and they're very, very effective. They're more effective than the suffragists were because the suffragists go off into their own causes. Uh, it was such a big tent, and here it's more focused. And that's another lesson to learn. Um, so in fact, the, um, the anti-suffragists uh, put their votes to good use. Over here. And then yes, over here and then back. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for coming. That was a wonderful discussion. I have two quick questions, one specific, one more broad specifically. <laughs> I'm curious, what significance do you place on the 1913 uh, march at Wilson's inauguration and the congressional mm -hmm. hearings that came after that? More broadly, I'm curious, I didn't want to ask you a question about men. Um, um, and so I'm curious if there were any, un any men that gave you any unexpected surprises. In terms of the 70-year history, I'm thinking of people like John Quincy Adams or mm -hmm. Senator Wilson after the Civil War or Congressman Bingham. Yeah, really deep thinkers who wrestled with federalism and civil rights. Did you find any of them who really wrestled with suffrage at both the philosophic level and how do I make this politically palatable? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'll just answer the march first. There's a wonderful book about the march by Rebecca Roberts. And if, if you are interested in the ins and outs of the 1913 march, the first national suffrage march, 8,000 women down Pennsylvania Avenue. This is organized by Alice Paul. This is sort of her debut in the movement. Um, and the women are attacked by mobs of men and boys. And they're beaten. They're thrown off their, uh, they're pulled off their the floats. Uh, they're, they're Dresses are ripped, they're stomped upon, their, their signs are destroyed, and the police don't do a thing. Uh, there's congressional investigations about it. It's really a scandal. Um, and it, this is all done on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Uh, and there, there's a, a story which uh, Rebecca tells in the book about um, Woodrow Wilson comes to Union Station to arrive to be inaugurated the next day, and he says, where is everybody? And they say, oh, they're at the suffrage march. Uh, so that's his, his introduction. Um, yes, there are many men who are champions uh, of women's suffrage. Uh, the, the, the young senator who um, uh, introduces it, uh, uh, Aaron Sargent from California. I'm trying to think, he may have been a congressman at that point. Um, there, there are many men in, in you know, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, an enormous, uh, calls himself a civil rights man. Uh, uh, pardon me, a women's rights man all his life. Um, seeing um, Teddy Roosevelt actually mm -hmm. changes his mind. Uh, there's some question about why he changes his mind in 1912, but he actually supports women's suffrage uh, for the last seven years of his life. Um, there, there are very interesting struggles going on with some men, but some, you know, uh, some famous um, senators are just against it, and whether that's because there's corporate pressure on them, uh, their, their funders, uh, or, the, or it's a constitutional question for them, or it's a religious question for them, or it's a racial question for them. So there's all kinds of different reasons that men will uh, become uh, supporters. There's actually another book, which I saw in your bookstore, called The Suffragents. And that's about the men who supported the movement. So you might be interested in that. Like over here, right? Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I almost didn't come because I wanted to rush home to keep reading your book, which I'm oh, halfway well. through. It's so great. <laughs> it's a real page turner. Um, how did you, so the, in the book she focuses on three women. How did you decide to focus on three women and how did you pick those three? Yeah, so, um, and I chose three women because they represent different aspects of the fight. Um, so Carrie Catt is the mainstream. She's, she's the protege of, of Susan B. Anthony. Um, she, she becomes her assistant. She learns the ropes. Uh, Susan Anthony, she chooses her uh, to be her um, a successor as the leader of the movement. So you have the, you know, the, the big cheese coming down, uh, but she's also, she's in her early 60s, 
She's, um, her legacy, she's the old, you know, the old guard at this point. Her legacy is in question and she is having to defend it. So she comes down from New York on the train and arrives in Nashville on the same night, this was a gift to any writer, the same night as the young um, protege of Alice Paul comes to lead the, the um, uh, National Women's Party campaign for the vote, which will take its own track, and they don't coordinate, and they step on each other's toes, but they're, they're both aimed at the same goal. Again, a very interesting lesson in women's organizations um, taking different approaches, shall we say, um, and fracturing at some points. And whether that helped or hindered and, uh, the movement, some s historians are still debating that, uh, but I think the synergy of having the, the uh, more radical activists and the more mainstream, um, you know, we know how to do this, uh, is a, uh, we're, we're seeing it in Congress right now. We're seeing that, that tension. Um, so those, she arrives the same night, and then Josephine Pearson, the head of the anti-suffrage movement in Tennessee, arrives that same night, and they're all you know, staying uh, in Nashville in the hotel. So it, as a writer, that was a very natural uh, just way to begin it, but also it allowed me to talk about the three main streams of women um, and you know why they're there and what they're doing and what their history is. So it, it worked out very nicely. I mean, I could have chosen, as, as you'll see, I have other uh, characters in there, but they become the main characters and allow me to, to branch out. So thanks for asking that. Three short things before we conclude the program. The first thing is, is please stay with us and enjoy the reception uh, and continue the conversation. The second thing is, is that Elaine is going to be signing copies of her book. We have them for sale as well, right behind the room uh, that we're in right now. And the third thing is, I'll put another plug in, June 4th, uh, 2019, the, the exhibit, Shall Not Be Denied, opens here at the Library of Congress on the second floor of the Thomas Jefferson Building. You can see some of the items and artifacts yes. and manuscripts that Elaine referenced in her talk will be on display during the exhibit. So we look forward to welcoming you here. The National Archives will also have an exhibit and also the National Portrait Gallery. So yeah. we're all together, we're all celebrating That's the exciting. centennial year of women's suffrage and we're really looking forward to it. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Colleen. <laughs>